information about the Paycheck uh, Protection Program, or PPP, um, updates on employee health, food safety, um, and also take a look at talent recruitment and employee and labor relations. So what I wanted to do is uh, introduce our panelists that we have on the call today. So if you can click to the next slide, Tom. So it, in, uh, and these are in order of, of kind of how we're gonna uh, guide the questions. Um, so first we have Bill Cornelius. Uh, Bill is the Senior Commercial Lender and Vice President at m and Bank. His responsibilities include consulting with both existing portfolio companies as well as prospective companies to understand their financial needs and how he can best leverage his bank's menus of products and services to structure solutions for both credit and non-credit needs. However, this current environment finds him in a little bit of a different situation. He is singularly focused on assisting and advising his client base through the COVID-19 pandemic. And this really includes, uh, especially over the last week or two, an in-depth knowledge of the new uh, Small Business Association's Paycheck Protection Program, PPP, and the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, which is the EIDL. Uh, so he's gonna be focusing a little bit about that. Next, we have Donna Schaffner. So Donna is the Associate Director of Rutgers Food Innovation Center, and she's in charge of food safety, quality assurance, and training programs. So Donna has served on the FDA's Food Safety Preventive Controls Alliance uh, while the FISMA regulations were being developed and has personally designed and implemented uh, customized food safety programs for processors in many different food categories all across the world. Next, we have Donald Schaffner. Uh, Dr. Donald Schaffner is an extension specialist in food scientists, and he's a distinguished professor at, the, at Rutgers University. His research interests include hand washing, cross-contamination, and quanti quantitative micro microbial risk assessment. He has authored more than 180 peer-reviewed publications and has educated thousands of food industry professionals around the world. Next, we have Roy Fazio. And I think, uh, I don't know if Roy is up. I can't see him on the screen yet. Um, uh, so Roy is a veteran of 44 years in the staffing industry. And he's also the partner, executive vice president and chief marketing officer for the protocol group. And for those who don't know who that is, it's a full service, independent and family owned and operated recruitment and staffing firm. Uh, it has offices in southern New Jersey and Philadelphia and employs over about 8,000 people annually in three different verticals, including industrial warehouse, healthcare, as well as office and professional. And last, and last but not least, uh, we have uh, our representatives from uh, Norris McLaughlin. First, we have Patrick Collins. Uh, Pat Patrick is the chair in, of uh, Labor and Employment Practice Group at Norris McLaughlin. He practices labor, employment, and personal law on behalf of employers and management personnel. He has a wide range of experience in a lot of areas of litigation in both federal and state courts, everything from defending discrimination and sexual harassment claims to claims brought under the, a the ADA or the Americans with Disabilities Act or the FMLA. And last but not least, we have uh, Keith McDonald. Uh, Keith is an attorney at Norris McLaughlin. Uh, he, his labor and employment law practices focus on the representation of management in all aspects of employment law, with particular focus on defending against discrimination claims under federal and state laws. That includes whistleblower claims, claims of harassment and discrimination and disability. So I know I kind of shared a lot with you, but we have a lot of expertise on the line. Um, and I, I just want to thank everyone for taking time out of the day to attend. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off and, and kind of break the, the, the next 50 minutes into kind of three segments. And, and the first segment is really going to be focused a little bit more on the CARES Act and the Paycheck Protection Plan. Um, and with that, uh, I want to kind of direct my, my first question to, uh, to Bill. But I also wanted to say, for, for those of you on the line, we're going to save the questions from you directly until the end of our session. Um, and if you've noticed on the bottom of your screens in Zoom, there is a, a Q&A as well as a chat feature. So if you do have questions that pop up throughout, um, you know, please feel free to go in there and ask your questions. We're going to try to get some to the end at the end. Um, and if, if for some reason, since we only have 50 minutes, uh, we can't, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, try to get those questions answered for you. Um, so, Bill, we're going to direct this question for you. Um, so, obviously, I think the hot topic right now, I know I've been receiving lots of questions, um, and you probably have too, regarding the CARES Act and specifically that Paycheck Protection Plan. I know you've been living in it, and banks across the nation are now taking those applications as part of the program. So, I was really just hoping that you could shed some light on the process, what it's looking like, and what eligibility looks like uh, for, for a lot of our members on the call. All right, good. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Again, as Mark said, my name is Bill Cornelius. Um, I work with m and Bank, and based upon being in the banking industry, we now are very busy with 
helping our clients through the CARES Act. So if, for those who aren't sure, what I'll do is do a little bit of a high-level uh, look at both programs, whether it's be the uh, Paycheck Protection Program or what they call the EIDL. It's an emergency loan on behalf of the SBA. So uh, both of these items were enacted into uh, law on March 25th. And you know both are open to small businesses, including nonprofits. So basically, the PPP, which is by far now the most popular of the two, uh, how it works is companies, uh, profits and nonprofits, can borrow up to $10 million in loans that are 100% forgivable. Now there are stipulations on how that uh, forgivable works, and we can discuss it later on. Probably lends itself better to a Q&A. Um, but basically what the PPP does is it basically is helping employers get people off the unemployment ranks and get them back into the office, get back into the manufacturing facility. And to do that, in essence, what uh, the federal government through the SBA is doing is floating each company you know, two and a half months of payroll. There is a payroll calculator uh, in the application itself. And again, that lends itself better to to Q&A. But basically, uh, what the PPP is, is it is up to, again, two and a half months worth of payroll or a, a ceiling of $10 million. Um, it's 100% guaranteed by the SBA. So, and there's no cost involved. The SBA pays the lender fees directly to the bank. So for the customer and for the bank, you know, it's, it's a fairly benign process. Uh, because, again, for the PPP, there's no collateral, there's no personal guarantees, so on and so forth, which is unordinary for the SBA. And, again, it's just assembled this way, so it can be done with speed. Um, the dollars come from the banks. Um, we're the facilitators of the program. So you apply at your local bank or the bank that you have a primary relationship with, and they will fund the loan. The SBA will come in at some point in the third or fourth quarter, even later than that, and basically pay the banks down, depending upon what is defined as a forgivable loan. Again, we can go into that in greater detail. So basically, what there's a calculator. You take your two and a half months of payroll, and you plug it in there. You know, and for sake of argument, you come up with a loan amount. That loan can be used to pay payroll, interest on mortgages, rents, and utilities. And the way it breaks down is 75% of your PPP proceeds needs to be spent on payroll. The other 25 can be spent on those other non-payroll items. Again, interest on mortgages, rent, and utilities. Um, there is a formula for the uh, forgiveness of the loan. It basically, at a high level, your employee roles have to be the same prior to uh, you applying for the PPP and after such. Um, you have to June 15th, if you've laid anyone off, you have June 15th to rehire them. Uh, and again, the whole thrust of this thing from the SBA is to get full employment status for the, for the PPP. Um, should you fall, should some of the loan fall out of a forgivable status, basically it would turn into a two-year loan at 1%. So again, it's a, it's a very favorable uh, facility with basically a no cost basis uh, for the um, for the applicant. And again, we can get into more on, you know, am I eligible and some of the um, uh, some of the basics and details of the program. The other one is not as widely used, but it's still there for clients is the EIDL, and that is more of an emergency type loan, which the SBA has always provided, but in this case will do so uh, for speed purposes where you know you only need collateral guarantees for loans up to 200,000. And you look to that, usually you look to that after all other lending options have been exhausted, but based upon the coronavirus crisis, that, is, that stipulation is now lifted. That works a little bit differently. The EIDL is a loan. So within it, you can, uh, you can apply for a $10,000 grant. Now that is, it's a grant. So it's, you don't have to, that's not payable back. So 
Um, the part of the EIDL, which goes up to $2 million, uh, it operates as a loan. It's a 30-year payback, again, based upon how it's structured, very, forget, very uh, favorable uh, to the borrower. So at a high level, those are the two loans. And then some people, and maybe we can cross more of this on Q&A, you know, who's eligible? Well, you know, basically all profit and nonprofit, you know, companies are eligible. I would say, you know, I'll be open to ask any questions here. What you want to do is, you know, you want to get to your bank where you have a primary relationship because the way it's been structured is you have to have a, a relationship with a primary deposit account with your bank uh, no later than February 20th, 2020 which has caused a little bit of an issue because there are some banks who are not participating in the PPP program. So um, your lender should be able to help you through that. Um, otherwise, again, there are a lot of nuances to each of these programs and it's probably better served, you know, for someone to ask a question because it would, I would take the whole 50 minutes here by going through each program and all the details, but it is out there. Um, for the PPP, it is capped at $350 billion. Sounds like a lot of money, yeah. but uh, it's on a first-come, first-served basis. So it's a national mad dash. Uh, we're not quite sure when those funds will be exhausted. What we hear uh, from the Treasury is that they are more than open to providing additional funds if there is, you know, even a small minority of U.S. companies who could apply for this and can't do it because the dollars are gone. Um, as of today, most of the banks are up and running where they're taking intake of the applications. M&T started on Monday. And just to give you a general idea, you know, we basically, um, and there's no approval process. Like I said, we're the facilitators. So basically you have to have a certain set of information. We'll take a look at your payroll calculator. If it seems reasonable, that's really, yeah, and through that, we have applicant. We have six billion dollars worth of applications, uh, which were as of yesterday. So, uh, what at the end of the day comes out the other end as funded, we we're not quite sure yet. And the one, you know, there may be some questions I can't answer today, and the reason being, uh, the one difficult part of this program is that there's never been really great guidance. It's always been gray, and you know, banks don't like gray, they like black and white. So um, even though, uh, you know, we're talking about this today, we've received a correspondence at at 2.15 uh, from the treasury with more tweaks on the programs, which we have to push out to our clients, as well as all other banks are doing that. So it's a great program um, and, you know, we're still in the very front end of this and uh, we'll see how quickly we can get funding out to companies that are in dire straits and need this money. So, uh, you know, just uh, I'll just let you know, you know, take it easy on your bank. You know, they're, they're moving as quickly as they can. Uh, but, you know, unfortunately, you know, in this case, the SBA and the Treasury, you know, they're acting as, as a governor in that. So we could move a little bit quicker. But like I said, uh, we're doing our best to get that money out there. So, Phil, obviously, you know, given what you just shared in terms of uh, the $350 billion and, and the number of applications coming through, uh, I would assume your recommendation is if, if this is uh, something that you could take advantage of to do so as quickly as possible? Do it as quickly as possible, but that doesn't mean rush through it because, right. you know, there's, a, there's not so much a checklist of stuff that the SBA needs, although they ask for stuff, but, you know, you know, payroll can come in Excel spreadsheets. Everything has to be converted to PDS, but Excel, QuickBooks. So really what we're looking at is, is the company doing their best in a good faith attempt to portray their information as accurate as possible? And if that's the case, again, every company produces, you know, not different sets of information, but it comes in different formats. But yeah, I would say, you know, this, if you're looking to apply, Unfortunately, yeah, do it as quickly as possible. And I know this, Bill, this, this might be predicting the, the, the obviously the future uh, a bit, but you know, what, what is your feeling from a, you know, from another, you know, potentially another stimulus plan coming from the, the, the government? 
Well, one thing, as you said, that I thought of something, you know, the SBA Treasury still has to provide information to the banks. So we don't believe funding for PPP is days away. We believe it's weeks away. Um, you know, it just kind of, uh, you know, it, it's funny that the Treasury basically is very open to providing additional dollars. And, uh, you know, I think uh, Treasury Secretary Minchkin basically said, yeah, if that's the case, we will do that. But uh, that's what he said two days ago, and we're not quite sure what he'll say in a week from now. Right. Obviously, a very fluid situation. As fluid as it comes. <laughs> Excellent. So I, I, I appreciate that, uh, that, Bill. I know I know that you uh, obviously with applications coming in yesterday, um, you're kind of living in the thick of it, and appreciate you kind of jumping on. Any anything else that you want to kind of provide any any guidance on that that might uh, benefit those who uh, own businesses and might be able to take advantage of one of these programs? Uh, if you're not sure about it, you know, call your local bank. You know, I'll provide my number. I have no problems walking anyone through it. But it's something you know. People say, "Hey, Bill, should I apply for the PPP? I'm doing okay today." Okay. But how long is this going to persist? Is we going to be in this situation? At 7.30, does your company have the working capital to carry you through 7.30? Because we were trying to be, I guess, uh, different clients because there are two, company, two types of companies that apply for the PPT. One is uh, the company that really needs the money to, you know, to pay payroll. And the other one is those who apply because they can apply. They don't necessarily need it. But I think, so we've asked what our companies and, and all companies maybe do a 13 week cash flow and take your, uh, and then take a look at, you know, how your company looks. But I would say there's too much uncertainty out there not to apply. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Bill. I appreciate the guidance. So I want to shift gears a little bit, obviously trying to, trying to take advantage of our, of our hour together. Um, you know, I'm going to shift gears a little bit more to kind of the health, uh, health safety, uh, police safety, as well as food safety. So I know that we have uh, Donna and Donald Schaffner who are, they're turning their videos back on. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, so I kind of want to direct these questions to you, obviously, but uh, anyone, uh, not only as our panelists, but even people on, on, on the phone, if, if you have an opinion, because I know we have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, owners of, of different manufacturing facilities who are living this day in and day out, uh, but I'll direct it to you at first. So. Um, obviously, there's a lot of information out there regarding uh, COVID-19. There's uh, the CDC guidelines, there's state, there's even local guidelines, um, and it can be a challenge to keep up. Um, and I know, I think the CDC actually just uh, shot over some guidelines over the weekend specifically for food processors. So I want to direct it to, to Donna and Donald. Um, you know, where, what is the best place to find in, uh, the most up-to-date information that you found and that you would recommend it to some of our members? I just pasted into the chat um, a link to FDA's webpage. Um, yeah. It's a little, the CDC website has is got really good, clear information, but not so much food focused. FDA's website is a little bit less clear because of course FDA is responsible for regulating foods and drugs and medical devices, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but if you, if you go to the URL that I just placed, uh, pasted into the chat, you can search by product area. And so if you, if you go to that page and you just type in food and beverages, it'll show you basically in a reverse chronological order, um, everything FDA has said um, regarding food and beverages, including uh, access to food, um, mitigating supply, interruptions. Um, uh, there's a really good one from uh, the 27th of last month on food safety and availability during the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so that's that's probably your your first uh, your first place to, to go to get information. All right. And the, the Rutgers Food Innovation Center, we have added a COVID-19 page to our website where we have links to <laughs> both of these that Dunn's just mentioned and um, quite a few other things. The uh, New Jersey Food Process Association has the COVID-19 website up. So you'll see there's every organization out there has a website up with information about COVID-19. A lot of these are just repeats. Um, on the Food Innovation Center website, we do have some question and answer sort of things that aren't exactly just what's been posted out there, but trying to give some guidance on 
what's happening or what some industry best practices are sort of working out to be on some of these issues. Excellent. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and I, sorry, go ahead. I would say I just sent another message. I thought I sent another message to the chat. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah you, it's, it's sort of uh, underneath the other one. I've been working with colleagues at North Carolina State to develop guidance. Right. Most of that is focused on retail and food service and not so much on food processing, but I'm also directing people to that. Uh, there's also just a lot of uh, good, good uh, common sense tips for being safe at home and, and answering questions that, that you may have from your, from your customers. Uh, I know my colleagues at, uh, in addition to my colleagues at the Food Innovation Center, um, uh, here uh, in New Jersey, uh, colleagues at Cornell University have also got some really good information, and I'll, I'll paste that into the chat in just a minute. I, I encourage people to go to, to all of those locations to, to look for information. No, th those are those are helpful helpful links. So if for anyone who if hasn't seen it, if you click on the the chat button down below, you'll see the two links that uh, Donald has sent over. Um, and then Donna, Donna actually plugged the the New Jersey Food Processors. If you go to uh, NewJerseyFoodProcessors.org. Um, our association's web place. We do have a, a section that I'll share at the end, which is COVID-19 uh, resources that you can access. And what we've been trying to do is take a lot of a lot of these links um, and a lot of this information and kind of uh, place on that site so that you have access to it. Excellent. Uh, so uh, you, it's you know we're talking in a lot of these resources uh, obviously and we've we've heard the catchphrase you know in terms of social distancing you know the best prevention methods for this virus obviously is a focus on proper personal hygiene and social distancing so so a number of questions that we got and that i hope you could you could provide some guidance on is how do we practice social distancing when a lot of us operate in work environments um that for instance have really really small break rooms or lunch rooms or locker rooms where there's 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 a there's a closeness that it's hard to get that six feet of social distancing or for instance in product lines that are very small and require a certain number of employees to fully staff the line so what are what are some of the things uh, the recommendations that you could provide us in, in terms of how do we how do we manage social distancing in those types of environments yeah, I, I guess I would say with great difficulty. Um, it, 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 it is really a challenge. Um, yeah. One one idea that I've heard uh, that that might have some merit, again, depending upon what your ability to implement it would be, um, is to run firewalled shifts, right? So if you run two shifts, make sure if, if it's possible within your operation, when your first shift is shut down, they clean and sanitize and then they leave the building. Second shift comes in, they also clean and sanitize and then, and then run their shift. And that's not that's not for food safety, that's for pr uh, protecting the integrity of those shifts, right? So if you have yeah. one individual on a shift who's sick, um, hopefully by, by segmenting the shifts in that way, you prevent that infection from spreading to other people on that, sh uh, to uh, people on the other shift. So you may lose one shift's production, but you'll have a second shift that's hopefully been, been firewalled off. But yeah, I mean, the, I, the idea of shared break rooms, I mean, all that is, is, really, is really tricky and that we don't have any magic bullets. Uh, okay. Obviously, many people probably saw the CDC came out with uh, cloth mask uh, guidance uh, over the weekend mm -hmm. or on Friday. Um, and so everybody I know um, who works in food safety has been learning how to sew uh, their own their own cloth yeah. masks because uh, of course there's no there's no masks available. So that's 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 a challenge. Um, hand washing, hand sanitation, um, you know, trying to again practice social distancing, share those break rooms as best you can. What we do know is that the, obviously the virus is spread from people who are actively symptomatic, right, uh, coughing and sneezing. Yep. But we also have evidence that the virus is spread by, by folks that are asymptomatic. Um, that asymptomatic, as near as we can tell, and again, we, we have limited information, but as near as we can tell, that asymptomatic shed, um, for that to happen, it's not just passing someone in a hallway, right? It's staying in, uh, in, a, in a confined space or in a close space with someone not, you know, uh, with cl closer than six feet, um, and then also for a period of time. Again, the exact period of time, we don't know, but, but so again, and I guess sort of the, what's the take home message from all of this? Per social, socially distance as best you can within those constraints, and then obviously think about innovative ways you can do that and still, and still run your operation. But there's no, unfortunately, there's no magic bullets. And so some of the things that I've heard people doing, um, whether you could put, a complete firewall between shifts, but at least staggering start times so that you don't have so many people in the locker rooms at the same time, staggering breaks and lunches. 
Um, if you've got your office staff staying at home, do you have some office areas unused that now people can use for their breaks and lunches? Um, putting, putting segregated areas that are not in active production, um, perhaps even part of a warehouse area that typically wouldn't allow food in there, but now you're setting it up as a break room or a lunch room. Some people are putting up tents outside because obviously it's been raining a lot, but putting out outdoor tables and chairs so that their employees can go out on a lunch break and still keep that six foot distance between them. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that's very helpful is actually putting marks on the floor. If you're working with um, cement floors with just chalk or you know, taping off, but putting some kind of mark so people can say, okay, I shouldn't have my chair this much closer to the next person, but what's actually six foot apart? Since sometimes people don't gauge that well. Right. So actually putting up markers where it's obvious to say, okay, you guys are too close together over here. Can you distance it out a little bit? So there's some, there's some very easy things that can be done to try to maximize that social distancing, even within the confines of a typically small break room. Um, most places are not serving food anymore. So if you're just bringing your own lunch, making sure they're bringing um, shelf stable type things that don't need refrigeration if you don't have enough of that available in that break room. Um, so if they're bringing protein bars or fruit things that, that don't have to be refrigerated and then they can eat them in areas that are not typically a food area as long as that's being designated on a written plan. So you have to be careful that people aren't just saying it's a free for all, I don't have to worry about GMPs, but we're, right. we're specifically designating certain areas where you can have breaks and lunches and we're gonna allow it during this time period. And then there has to be some documentation of those things. Okay. No, that's, those are, those are uh, you know, I've, I've heard the similar uh, things in terms of not only staggering break rooms, but I, I've, uh, I've heard a lot about the tent idea. Um, you know, set, setting up an external tent so that it would actually, you could use your break room as well as some external areas now that the weather's getting a little bit more warm um, as, as a way to, to, to break that area up. Um, you, know, you know, especially speaking of a kind of the social distancing, you know, I, I kind of wanted your perspective also from an employee health perspective. So, um, you know, especially a, a lot of members on the phone uh, are coming from what, what we consider obviously essential employees. Uh, and, and working in the plants. What, what have you seen a number of those organizations do to ensure the health and safety of employees coming into the plant? Um, I've heard a lot of uh, information about health questionnaires, temperature checks, and those types of things. What, what have you seen that has, uh, that uh, some of your, your clients are, are implementing as well as things that you've seen be successful? So, so, so people should be going to work if they're obviously sick anyway. So we already have adverse health you know, practices in place for processing plants, that's anyone who has gastrointestinal illness, if they're vomiting or diarrhea, they can't come to work. If they're sniffling, sneezing, runny nose, they shouldn't be coming to work. So those were already in place. So I've just mm -hmm. seen that places are maybe being a little bit tighter on checking and some places are implementing the temperature checks. And uh, important for places to understand too, if you're putting temperature checks for employees coming into the plant, going into a processing area, that should be everybody. It's not just your line workers, that's your supervisors, that's your yeah. USDA inspector, your FDA inspector, anybody who's coming in there. Um, USDA did put out a statement that you can question them about where they've been, are they, are they going into multiple plants? Do they have any family members who are ill? And that you can take their temperature also with um, the non-touch forehead thermometer type thing. So that is a statement that USDA put out. The inspectors can be asked to do that, but it should be an across the board. If you're putting that type of thing into place that there's no um, profiling or discrimination could be attached to it, but it's everybody going into that processing area. Yeah, and the, the only thing I'll add on, on temperature checks, uh, I, I appreciate Donna's comment about forehead check. Realize that uh, taking somebody's temperature with a thermometer under the tongue is considered a medical procedure. And so uh, that would be, have to be done by a medical professional. It has to be a trained individual. If you don't do that and you make a mistake, um, there's implications either way. So just be sure that you investigate that uh, with your HR folks and, and make sure that you're doing it in, in a way that is, is compliant with the law and that where the data is, is valid. 
Excellent. You, you know, um, obviously, as we know, you know, we're, we're taking a lot of these precautions, um, you know, to, to ensure that the, those who either, obviously, it's hard to identify necessarily asymptomatic individuals, but those uh, who, who, who are positive or are exhibiting symptoms don't kind of inflect lines. Um, and, you know, however, it, it has happened. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I know a number of uh, businesses within the state of New Jersey had had shut down lines or even the entire plant. Uh, because someone has been infected and they had to clean the, the, the entire uh, facility. So, you know, in terms of from a cleaning perspective, uh, what resources are available and what chemicals should we be using to, to not only kill the virus, yet maintain some of the quality standards that we have in those food processing areas? So, you want to answer that, yep. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you wanted to answer. Um, so, <laughs> we, so we, don't, we don't know. Obviously, we, there's a lot we don't know about this virus, okay? Yep. But what we do know is it does not appear to be any more resistant than any other organisms that we're already controlling for food safety. Um, if you go to uh, the CDC website, um, they have a link to EPA, um, and I'll, I'll post that link into the chat in just a minute. Um, but basically, anything that you're already doing for food safety should work to control the virus. And so there's really, and this is the same advice we've been giving people for, for food safety at home. It's the same advice we've been giving for, for, for restaurants and, and food service uh, and grocery stores. And so it's same for food processors. Right. So the, the important thing with this, if you're using something as a sanitizer to clean up after you've had a positive COVID-19 case in your plant, is making sure you're using it according to the label directions for that purpose. So typically with the sanitizers, there might be different residence times depending on which organism you're trying to kill. So um, the chemical supplier that we used, he's already, he came in, sent us all this information, but he said, be sure you read the label and for, um, it wasn't pre-printed for COVID-19 on any of this, but the SARS virus or some of these other ones, he said, you know, it, so make sure there's a residence time of five minutes or a certain amount of time of this resident on that surface before you can say that it's actually killing that virus. On the EPA website, they do, they do keep updating as they add some more things to that. So just make sure that you're, sanitizer is specifically on their website to kill COVID-19 in the concentration that you're using. Yeah, so I pasted the link into the chat, um, but, but it, I mean, just to underscore what Donna said, it's about the active, the concentration of the active agent and it's about the contact time and you have to follow what it says on, on the EPA website. If not, then you're in violation of the law. So just, just like with any, any other EPA regulated chemical. Right. And it's really, really important if you have had some a positives in your plant that you are documenting that concentration and that residence time and that you're meeting that. Because keep in mind that right now we're talking about regulatory standards, but if, if people do make claims that they were made sick from your food in the future, you could be facing civil lawsuits and you want to make sure that you've got the documentation in place that you did everything the right way. Don't just say, I cleaned it up, but I cleaned it up with this concentration for this amount of time, and this matches my label. So if you're talking to Bill Marler or somebody like that, <laughs> you can show them that you took the proper steps and that you were paying attention to these details and that you documented it at the time, not trying to reconstruct it later, but at the time you're using it. Obviously, documentation is, is, is key in that area to ensure um, uh, compliance, obviously, as well. Uh, you know, just one, one last question, um, and, I, and I know there's been a lot, a, lot of, a lot of questions, and I know CDC has posted guidelines, but I just want to make sure, you know, from your perspective, you know, what impact is there on food production itself if, if someone is testing positive or come in contact with someone that is positive? Are there any implications on our, the food product that's on that manufacturing line? <laughs> Well, well I, I think that, I think that, that 
The yeah. definitive information is going to come from FDA. So um, I will, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll find the, the, the information, the current, again, again, and with all of these conversations, right, it's, I think it's really important that we timestamp them, right? These right. are, this yeah. is the best available That's information that we are giving today, Tuesday, April 7th at 3.41 p.m., right? In right. an hour, it might change, right? But, but that's the important thing to realize. And I, again, I'll, I'll, find the, I'll find the information on the FDA website and I'll paste it into the chat. And they're really, and you know, it's interesting. If you look at what FDA is saying, they're also saying that ultimately there may be, um, you know, that, that sometimes plants will need to look at what state and local uh, recommendations are, right? And so that, that can add an interesting wrinkle um, if, if FDA is saying one thing and your state or your local folks are saying something different. But, uh, but again, I would say I would certainly go from a personal point of view, I'm going to trust what FDA is saying. They've got, you know, their top scientists looking at this and coming up with the best possible recommendation. And also, what is your product? Yeah. Yeah. So in general, it's not likely that this virus is going to be spread on food, given packaging, shipping, storage times. But if you were to be making uh, a fresh baked goods that are going out today and somebody coughs or sneezes on it and puts a live virus on it, who's to say that how fast it's being eaten? So there are some situations where you know, that you want to be more cautious with that type product than something that you know is going to sit on the shelf for a few months before it goes out there. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's a little bit of uh, common sense needs to go into this also. Excellent. All right, excellent. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Donna and Donald. I, I appreciate that. And I, and I do, uh, Donald, you've raised a good point. Everything that we're talking about right now is timestamped, right? So there could be additional guidelines or updates or changes beyond today. Um, this is as what we know of now, and, and obviously everyone knows that this is, is constantly changing. So let me shift gears a little bit to our, 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 last, uh, our last kind of segment, um, and that's really around, um, you know, more of a, our employment labor relations component, as well as recruitment and staffing. So I'll, I'll direct this first question to, to Roy, uh, who's on the line. Um, so obviously, opposed to a lot of other industries at this point in time, um, we, you know, our, the food industry is deemed essential within the state uh, and within the country to meet current food demand. So this is, this is a lot of increased capacity that's coming into our manufacturing lines, which is also increases the need for workers. Um, so what resources, Roy, are available uh, to food processors to help us meet some of these, these, these increase in demand given this, this crisis? Well, there is, um, uh, of course, there's a lot of technology that, that's out there. And, you know, the staffing and recruiting industry, um, you know, is pretty much on up on a lot of the technology. We have uh, uh, vendors that are uh, uh, constantly offering us um, technology. I know what, uh, what we do at, at Protocol Group is um, we, we service a lot of the essential employers in the, in the food industry and in healthcare. And two totally different areas uh, when you're looking for compliancy of uh, unskilled labor versus healthcare workers. But uh, we use, because uh, we use all the job boards that are out there, and, you know, we've, uh, we use Facebook. Uh, you know, we're always looking for referrals from our employees uh, as, as a source. Um, and we also, um, I have, um, I've shared, I've had the, um, uh, the benefit of chairing a staffing and recruiting uh, organization of 37 companies around the country. We don't compete and we share best practices. Um, and we've held, uh, we've held, we hold mastermind uh, meetings uh, regularly and share best uh, ideas. One of our members has an offshore recruiting company and what we do is we use them not to get in touch with our employees, but they scrape all the job boards overnight um, and we have, a, we have a centralized recruitment center out of Woodbury. So uh, what they've done, we have six branch offices and they, they, um, they screen and now they're interviewing uh, candidates in that recruitment center. But so when they come in in the morning uh, from this offshore company, all the job boards are scraped so that we have all these candidates waiting to be called that have applied to our, our job boards and our, our, our Facebook ads. So they get on the phones and, uh, 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 and make those calls. I mean, one of the, the biggest areas that we had to look at was really look at our processes. Even before, uh, COVID, before the coronavirus hit, we had to really look at, you know, um, 
it's just so difficult and that there weren't so many many people out there that you can recruit even for unskilled labor we had to look at our processes how difficult were we making it for candidates really to come through and apply and then go through the whole process of interviewing screening and then onboarding onto our uh, a customer we also have a technology called uh, call them all so once we um we get a request from a from a customer uh, call them all sends out a text message and uh, an email to all the candidates in our database um, uh, to let them know we have a job available and, uh, and to respond right away and then the phones usually ring off the hooks when we get get that out so to answer your question yeah, yeah. you know a lot of its technology a lot of it's really looking at streamlining your your processes that we used to use that really you don't need today. You really look at what, what do we really need to knock out of our processes. Right. Yeah, in, in, we were talking about social distancing a little bit. You know, how do we, how do we hire, uh, you know, I, I know I could speak for, for Campbell's and some of our, our facilities, we're, we're hiring hundreds of people. Um, you know, how do you go about doing that when social distancing is in place and, and you know, we're try, everyone's trying to clamp down on, on not having live interviews and those types of things. What, what are you seeing some of your clients do to kind of hire in this, this virtual non-contact environment? Well, uh, in the, the case I'm aware of, they're using uh, staffing companies like, uh, you know, Protocol Group. And we have, the re we have the responsibility for doing all the compliancy. Um, the uh, federal government has eased some of the I-9 uh, requirements uh, to make it a little easier. All our people that used to interview, all our internal staff that, that interview and uh, are now working out of home. So all of our interviews now are being done on the, on the telephone and, and all our screening. Uh, so we're asking the right questions. And then, you know, once we get done the interview and the screening, then they have to fill out some e-document processes such as the uh, the I-9s and the W-4s and, you know, offering health insurance. And then it depends on our client. Some clients still want to do the drug screenings. And if they do, then we, we ask the clients to do the drug screenings. Well, we used to do them because of processes and the time, timeliness of getting people out there and available. Uh, we've had our clients doing them. Uh, um, so I hope that answers your uh, question. And, no, thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. You know, with, with you know, uh, and, and maybe, uh, you know, uh, our uh, attorneys from Norris McLaughlin can help on this one. Um, you know, with, um, you know, it's not only attracting the talent, it's also, it's also keeping the talent. You know, obviously, a, a lot of our organizations um, are, are being impacted because we have individuals who are having daycare challenges right, who, who aren't able to show up to work, even they are considered essential because they have to care for a loved one, a child whose daycare is closed, the school is closed, things like that. What are you seeing from, from some of the groups that you work with? What are they doing around attendance policies? What are they doing to, to help some of those employees um, kind of weather this storm from an attendance, uh, no call, no show perspective? Is that question? I can respond mind? to that. This is Keith okay. McDonald. Yeah. Roy, I can handle that one. Uh, what we've been seeing is uh, from both the advice from the EEOC and Department of Labor have been preaching flexibility and the the emphasis has been on uh, having employers continue to employ as many folks as possible through the different plans that we're talking about, but also an emphasis on uh, act in good faith, be flexible with your workforce in terms of scheduling, time off, attendance, in hopes that that will keep the employees, number one, coming to work, keep the element of fear down amongst the employees and that they're coming to a safe environment, an environment that's been clean, that is effectively been sanitized. Um, and maybe that may require shortening certain shifts or having, as uh, I believe Don mentioned before, breaks in between shifts where you have this uh, cleaning process. So that's the on the one side and on the flip side is incentives um we've had some clients that have had difficulty uh having employees show up when the rumor the rumor mill picks up that someone has been infected or someone's family member has been infected right and maybe that's uh retention bonuses if you stay 90 days and maybe you it's it's non-monetary in the form of additional vacation times for those employees that are 
coming in and, and, and working now that they may see at the end of this some additional time off. So those are some of the things we've been seeing uh, from our clients. Keith, if I can add that uh, to that, I think a, a big part of it too is, uh, is the engaging, uh, you know, with your employees, you know, we're constantly communicating and staying in touch with them. Uh, you know, one of the things that's been important really is because um, we have several employers that we, essential employers that we serve, is assuring a healthy environment is, is really key. Um, we've act, out of our healthcare uh, our company, we've been providing uh, nurses or medical assistants on at the beginning of each shift uh, to do the wand um, temperature screens. Um, the challenge in the beginning was getting the wands. Um, uh, you know, we were uh, so trying to find out where to get them in time. In fact, I just I found a resource from one of our our uh, fellow staffing uh, member companies down in Texas that uh, has a manufacturing plant that we were able to get some for. So we're actually providing the people in the wands in a lot of cases. The other another incentive uh, really is uh, to reduce absenteeism. We've actually been uh, uh, giving monthly attendance bonuses out uh, and partnering with our clients to that. Uh, we also have, uh, we've increased the hourly pay for the next eight weeks up to $2 an hour for unskilled labor. Uh, and we've also uh, implemented with a lot of our clients uh, monthly drawings with prizes, um, which, uh, which is part of the engagement and, and gives somewhat of an incentive for employees to work there. But the biggest key is really, uh, is really selling uh, the environment of the client before we, if it's a new candidate going out there. Uh, you know, really that it's a, a safe environment and then they're helping their community by going out there and, and, uh, and, and, and working there. It, no, and, and I, I think the, the, the key there is, and I, I think you both hit on it, is both, um, you know, it could be, it's, it's engagement, it's, it's both not monetary as well as non-monetary incentives to ensure that the people are operating in a safe and, and healthy environment and, and try to reduce the fear as much as possible. Um, you know, Roy, you brought up and, and Donna mentioned, we we're talking about temperature checks. So I just wanted to make sure, obviously, when, you, when you're thinking of temperature checks, and we talked about the under the tongue versus the, the on the forehead, um, you know, what is the legal, what, what do we have to be mindful of when we're doing it to ensure that we're not invading privacy or, or creating any type of, uh, pr you know, privacy concerns with, with some of our employees as we're doing this? And I don't know if Keith or uh, Pat, if you have a sure. Yeah, yeah I had prepared you might for, want to answer yeah, that. Yeah, I prepared for that answer. Oh. Yeah, we oh. had some guidance about yeah. two weeks ago from the E uh, from the EEOC on these issues. So the, the the first piece of that guidance said that it's okay for an employer to ask uh, employees if they're experiencing symptoms of COVID nineteen. So that could be include information of are you have having fevers, chills, cough, shortness of breath, or a sore throat. Typically under the ADA, those would be precluded, right. but now uh, under the EOC has said that's okay. In addition to that, um, measuring an employee's body temperature is permissible even without, um, you don't need an indication before that. It's okay to do that across the board. I think someone pointed out before, yeah. we don't want to do that in a discriminatory fashion. We don't want to do it for you know only the night shift. We want to do that for all of our employees because we have the same interest in no one coming in with, with uh, any symptoms. In addition, um, we we have the right now as employers to tell employees when we believe they're ill in good faith that we can tell them to go home. There's nothing wrong with that, and we can also tell them before they come back that they need a doctor's note, almost like a fit for duty note. Um, that could be a bit problematic right now given. Uh, the, the pressure on the on the medical profession. Um, so so you know again in terms of thinking about flexibility, some of the guidance from the EEOC has been well, you know you may not get a full letter fitness for duty examination letter from a doctor. You may get something from a clinic that says this person has been cleared and is is not uh, suffering from COVID, and that may be enough. But you know we can require those things with respect to hiring. Um, you are allowed to now have someone tested for COVID-19 before you hire, after you do the interview. And if that person does test positive, uh, there's a right to withdraw the offer. Um, and the EEOC has said that that's okay as well. So those were the main points that the EEOC came out with. I think it was in middle of March and um, 
and those are being updated as well. Okay, well, I just want to throw in there, um, one problem with that is, um, I know a number of people who've gone to doctors and clinics and they refuse to test them because they didn't have enough symptoms. So sending someone who's not seriously ill to be tested, a lot of places are refusing to test if they don't meet at least three of the criteria of having a high fever above 100.4, uh, shortness of breath, and an additional over a certain age or whatnot. So it could be difficult to get asymptomatic uh, prospective employees tested. Um, and the same thing with getting the doctor's note about going to work or coming back to work before or after, um, if they do or don't have it, uh, they, they may not be able to get a, a definitive test at this time. Now, hopefully they're gonna be having more tests available. But right now, my doctor's office and a lot of them, I know in this area, will not test you, you know, unless you have. But yet, <laughs> you know, evidence is telling us that quite a few people who are asymptomatic have the virus and can be passing it on, which, you know, personally, I'd rather know who was passing it around to everybody else, even if they're not sick enough to be going to an emergency room and be intubated. But of the, because of the scarcity of the test, <clears throat> and even if you get someone tested right now, um, they're being told it may be six to eight days before you get the answer back. So how much good that's doing you? Do you let them yeah, come to work hoping it's negative? Or do you make them not come in because for eight more days because they may be spreading it if they do have it? And that's if you could get them tested. So. Some of this is, is a little more difficult than just saying, go get tested. That's, that's one of the things that the, the practicality yeah. of some of this is, as an employer, you may be having to make a decision that this person appears to have symptoms, and if you're doing a temperature check, is it above 100.4, right? We know that temperature normally varies between different people. Somebody's normal temperature might be different than somebody else's. It will vary a degree or two for a lot of different reasons. But the, the number that's been put out there is 100.4. If it's above that point is being said, well, you seem to have a fever. And at that point, that could be a screening mechanism to say, we don't want you to come in as long as you're running a fever. And with or without a doctor's note, that's where it gets, if you can't get a, a test for that, then you may be having to tell employees that you don't want them coming in, even without the doctor's note part of it. Yeah, and I, I believe that is, is a concern, especially here in New Jersey, where the amount of tests are much higher than the rest yeah. of the country. So, you know, the EOC, generally speaking, on a national basis, I don't right. think they focused on those particular issues. but. The one point I would make, and it will transition to the piece that Pat was going to talk about briefly, which is the family leave portion, is there is kind of a good faith, you know, the, the, these entities are understanding that there's a good faith type of protection for an employer here, right? These are new laws. We're trying to enforce very new laws in very new situations. And even in the family leave section, which uh, Pat's going to speak to briefly, um, they've, they've kind of reserved that protection for employee, employers that are acting in good faith and trying to do the right thing and being protective and helping employees. So Mark, I'll let you just transition that piece. Yeah, I mean, I, you, know, uh, you know, thank you kind of for setting that up. And, you know, for, for those of you who don't know, um, it recently was passed as the, the FFCRA, which is the Family's First Coronavirus Response Act. So, you know, I was just trying to, you know, get, get some additional guidelines on you know who does that impact? Does that apply to our business? Um, and what do we need to know as employers to to abide by that act? So hi everybody. Uh, the screen might say that I'm Mike Blumel, but that's our IT manager. Uh, my name is Pat. <laughs> um, and uh, before I get into the uh, Families First uh, law, I think the CDC has actually updated its. Uh, advice as to when a person can come back to work. And there's two different scenarios. I think there's one where there is a test available and there's another scenario where there is not a test available and a person has to be symptom free for so many days. And, and so that's worth checking out too, because I believe what Donna was saying is really a problem that the doctors are not giving the test to people. 
for making judgment calls on the spot, uh, saying you don't look sick, sick enough, we need to save these tests. I've had that happen over and over again. So I, I just want to give you a, a two minute sort of rundown of uh, this law, the Families First Coronavi Coronavirus Response Act. Uh, we've heard it being called FICRA, uh, labor att attorneys love acronyms, right? So the law went into effect last week, April 1st. It remains in effect until the end of the year. Um, basically, it's a, it's a seven-part law. The part that the employment attorneys and, and employers are focusing on, there are three parts. There's a paid sick leave part, there's a paid family leave part, and then there is a, a, a tax credit part. It applies to anybody that has 500 or less than 500 employees. Uh, and, and the two parts have different eligibility requirements. The paid sick leave part, it starts on the day that you hire your employee. The paid family leave part, you have to uh, uh, be employed for 30 days. So if um, when the law went into effect on, on April 1, you had to have been hired by March 2. Um, so uh, everybody has mentioned how much information has been coming out and it's just astounding how fast the government is being uh, push to provide this information, but uh, there's lots of information about this law. The, the U.S. Department of Labor is the uh, government entity in charge of uh, enforcing this law. Just go usdol.gov. It's going to take you right to the coronavirus site, like all of these other uh, uh, websites. They have published information sheets. They have published FAQs, uh, frequently asked questions, and it seems like you have to check that every day because they're throwing another 10 or 15 FAQs on as you wake up in the morning. It's like law school all over again. You have to learn everything for the new day. Um, the IRS has put out a very good information sheet and FAQs about how you should be documenting this so you get your tax credit, so you don't uh, get in any kind of a bind later on. New Jersey's DOL site uh, has great stuff on there. Uh, they've recently updated their unemployment page uh, to show you how this is going to work with the federal uh, subsidies, to show you how this is going to work for partial unemployment. Uh, so all of these are, are very, very good resources. Quickly, what does the uh, uh, FICRA uh, provide? The family leave part is, is pretty narrow. It provides, there's 12 weeks of family leave, the first two weeks are unpaid, and the only reason you could take this paid family leave is if your child's school or daycare is closed, they're under 18 years of age, or the, or the care provider is unavailable, and you cannot work, you cannot telework, you have to stay home with your kid. Uh, so the first 10 days are unpaid, the last 10 weeks are paid. Uh, this particular family leave pays you two thirds of your regular rate, capped at $200 a day, uh, capped at $10,000. So $200 a day times five days, $1,000, 10 weeks of paid, uh, family leave is $10,000 potentially. Uh, employees are supposed to give as much notice as possible. We all know that schools are closed, but what happens is all of a sudden the baby get, the babysitter gets sick or, or, or someone that is a, a care provider gets sick and, and you know, uh, mom and dad are home and, and they, can't, uh, they can't get someone to cover. So that's been happening. Uh, there's a, an, ex, an exception uh, from, usually family leave has a requirement that you are returned to your position. If you have 25 employees or left, or less, there's a possible uh, exemption for you about returning to work. Um, the paid sick leave portion uh, is much more expansive, uh, but it's much more focused. It's two weeks of paid sick leave, up to 80 hours for full-time employees, and part-time employees get two weeks to the equivalent of whatever they work. So if I work Tuesday and Wednesdays, uh, I get two weeks of Tuesday and Wednesday paid under this. There's six different reasons that you can get the paid sick leave. Three of them relate to you being sick. So there's a federal, state, or local isolation or quarantine order. When this first came out, it caused a lot of confusion and people like were saying, okay, Governor Murphy's a stay at home order. Isn't that an isolation order? And it's only these orders that are directed to individual employees, these, these sort of community-wide, statewide orders. That's not what we're talking about here. Uh, you've been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine. So you get that doctor's note. We, we're not going to give you a test, but you've got the symptoms. We want you to stay home for 14 days. Or you're experiencing these symptoms and you're going to the doctor to find out what's going on. What it doesn't cover is the person that says to you, you know, I don't feel good. I'm just going to stay home. And they don't go to the doctor. It doesn't cover the person that says, you know, I, I'm just too afraid to come to work. 
I, I don't want to do this. I'm just going to stay home. Or the person that says, look, I'm okay, but I have a family member at home that's got a comp compromised immunity and you know, I don't want to go out and I don't want to get my family member sick. It does not cover that. So the other uh, reasons for paid sick leave is if you are caring for somebody uh, who is sick, who has been quarantined, who's gone to the doctor, if your child is home because school has closed, uh, or any other substantially similar condition that's specified by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. The, the, the DOL has announced as of yet there are no other similarly situ situated conditions. So for there's two different kinds of pay, two different levels of pay. If I get sick for any of the first two reasons, I can get my regular rate of pay uh, up to a cap of $511 a day for an aggregate over the two week period of $5,110. If I'm taking care of someone, if I'm home because my child is home and I can't work, uh, I go back to the $200 a day max, two thirds of my, of my pay, uh, $200 a day max. Um, the paid sick leave that's provided under this law, and this is like the language that's just pulled right from the law, it's in addition to any other paid leave that you, that you may provide to your employees, and you, are not, you cannot require that your employ, employees use their other leave before they use this. So if you have PTO, if you have paid sick leave, uh, and one of your employees qualifies for paid sick leave under FICRA, they get to use that first, and you can't make them use the other one after that. Uh, it doesn't carry over. Um, the tax credits are dollar for dollar up to the cap. So these FAQs that have been coming out have been very, very helpful. Like a lot of employers, a lot of our clients have been asking, well, can we pay the difference? If they, if they are getting this and we're getting a tax credit, can we pay the difference to match up to their salary? And you can, but you don't get the tax credit for uh, over and above what the cap is. You also get a tax credit if you are carrying your health insurance for that too. Uh, there's a poster that came out. You all, you all probably have it up. You probably uh, have folks that are already receiving benefits about this uh, uh, right now. I, I would check out the FAQs, uh, wealth of information in there, and that's uh, that's the best place really to, to stay up to speed on all the new developments. Yeah, no, excellent. I mean, I, I know it's uh, you know what, what you just went over was was uh, was pretty expansive, and and you, you I think the the the, the guidance of going to usdol.gov is is a, is a good one. Um, obviously, connect with your your HR partners in, in your situations to see if it applies to your business. Um, thanks, Matt. I appreciate kind of breaking that down in such a in such a quick and concise manner. So I know it's a lot more complex than, than you just made it seem. Um, so I listen, I, I recognize we're about eight minutes over than what we initially anticipated and, and, and uh, I'm pr pretty terrible at keeping the time for those who know me. Um, but I, I think there's, there's so much information out there and th there's so much need. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to close things down here, um, but that doesn't mean that the, the questions can't kind of stop. I think what's important about being a you know being part of our uh, this association and, and being with us is is access to all these different types of resources. So you know for, for those of you who have some additional questions, you know please please uh, please feel free to to reach out to us, ask those questions, and we will do our best to to try to provide you with some some answers or resources or guidance. Um, you know for for, for additional information, uh, check out the New Jersey Food Processors.org website. Um, on that website, we do have a link to COVID-19 resources, um, and you can also contact uh, our association for some of those questions. Um, I just want to thank everyone uh, who, who just turned their video cameras back on. Uh, I like how you guys are just like real quick with that. Um, you know, I just want to thank everyone on the calls. I know you're, you're dealing with this, you're living in the, you know, sick of it. Um, and I appreciate the time that you took out of today to kind of share your insights and, and perspectives with, with, uh, with us. Um, so thank you very much. We, we appreciate it. Uh -huh. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Happy to help, Mark. Thank you. Thanks. Um, nice job, Mark, and by all the speakers. Great job. Yeah, and, and if there's, if there, guys, if there's, if there's additional questions that you might have, what we're trying to do is we might put on a, a few more town halls. Obviously, there's this information is changing uh, kind of in the moment. So if there is a different additional topic areas that you'd like to address or, or dig into a little bit deeper, let us know. Um, and, you know, if this has been a benefit for, for everyone, um, we will continue to have them. So, so thank you very much. Um, and uh, I hope everyone has a great rest of the day. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks, Barb. Bye. All right. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks.